Uh, Bethany is a Jesus-built church. That's our motto. We explained that once again last week, that we are a church built on three pillars of a foundation of Jesus Christ. The first one is the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The great commandment to love, your, love the Lord your, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And the last pillar is the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're a, a Jesus-built church. That's our focus. That's our ministry. We want to do those things that enhance that to allow Jesus to work in and through us in the world in which we live and in our community. You see, it is Jesus that said, I will build my church. And he's been in the building process ever since he said that. The day of Pentecost church started. It went on through the book of Acts. The book of Acts has no end. It does not say at the end of it, the end. Not like all the movies, all the books, the end. It's not there. Uh, because it continues on. We are the representation of that today. Jesus is at work in our church. We saw last time that we are God's building from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It actually says in the text, you are God's building. You are God's building. And we're not talking about the building here, the, the bricks, the mortar. We're not talking about the, the beams and all of that. The church is the people. So when Paul writes, he says, you are God's building. You are God's church. You are. Now today we want to focus on God's temple. God's temple. And to do that, I want to jump back to a passage in the book of John, John chapter 2. Jesus had uh, performed his first miracle, changing water to wine at Cana of Galilee. And uh, then they made, because it's Passover, he made his way into Jerusalem. And the Jews must have heard his reputation. And then all the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority uh, to do all this? He said, come on, Jesus, do something. Perform for us. And Jesus responded of the temple facts. He said, I want you to get this straight. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Now, you know that later they're going to use these words that accuse Jesus of blasphemy, that he was going to uh, destroy the temple and, and raise it up in three days. That was blasphemous. And it's one of the things they tried to pin on him so they could crucify the Lord of glory. But Jesus said, destroy this temple, the temple. Now, we know from the context, okay, because he goes on and tells us, the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, thinking of the Herodian temple that Herod had been working on for the last 46 years, and it hadn't been completed yet. It was still in the working process. And he said, now, you're going to raise it in three days? Come on. How are you going to build something that's taken 46 years to build on the previous foundation of the Solomon temple? Uh, how are you going to do that? And then Jesus says, the text says, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. His body. The body is the temple. We all dwell in a temple. We all dwell in a body. A body. Jesus was in a body. He was incarnate. The Son of God, God the Son, had invaded a human body. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary's womb. He took residence in that body. And so the body served as his temple because God was dwelling in his temple. It's kind of like you and I. We live in a body. I'm in a body. And so it says here, they're speaking about the body as a temple. Here Paul calls our bodies, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, after he's talked about the building. You are a building. You are a building. He goes on to say that we're not just any kind of building. We are a temple. He says, do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple? God's temple. So I try to depict a body there that inside has the temple. <laughs> Your body is the temple. It's not just a body. It's a very sacred place. Because he says the occupant inside the body is not just you. The occupant inside the body, he says, is that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now, the moment I received Jesus Christ as an eight-year-old boy, 
you know, I, I was assured by the preacher then after I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart that I had, was forgiven of my sins and I had eternal life. But there was something else that took place that he didn't tell me about. I didn't feel it. But the Holy Spirit took up residency within my body. The Holy Spirit invaded me. At that moment, my body, the building, the flesh, the building that he'd been talking about previous in this passage, my body became a sacred temple of God because God invaded my body. You know what? He hasn't left. He hasn't left. I know there's a little confusion because there's a verses in the Bible that says be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe it does, do I get empty of the Holy Spirit? and Do, do I get them in quantities and stages? But no, the, the word filled isn't the idea that you're, 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 you got a little bit and you keep getting more and more in it. The idea is it's kind of like a motel. When you drive by a motel, the motel says, it has a sign outside, vacancy, right? That means there's empty rooms. But if the sign says no vacancy, what does that mean? Does that mean you could not cram another body into the, the rooms? No, no, it just means every room is occupied. I got all the Holy Spirit I was ever going to get. Today, I got saved at eight years old. He invaded me. He never left me. He's never forsaken me. He's always with me. But when it says to be filled, it is to allow him to occupy more of the rooms of my life. Allow the Holy Spirit. It says be filled. It's passive. You have to do this. You allow him to take control. It's kind of like in our, in our, 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 our bodies, our lives, we have compartments, and we've got doors on them, and we've got little keys that are all locked up. Some doors we, uh, we keep locked because, oh, that's my dark side. I don't want anybody to know of that about me. And so we don't want God in that room, so we keep him out of that part of our life. And we keep him out of our social life. We keep him out of our work life. We keep, oh, yeah, he's there. We open the door to my church life. Oh, everybody can see that I'm a Christian at church. But he's locked out of the other rooms. And what are you saying is, no, no. Let him fill every room of your life. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Why? Because he lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Your body is his temple. He dwells in you. That's the whole point he's making. I just want to try to isolate it there on the screen. You are that temple. You're the temple of God. Is God in this place? You know why he's in this place? Because he's in you. And you are in this place. Is he here? Well, of course, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But is he in there in some really special way when there's nobody here? You know, it's just an empty building. But he is with you always. You are the temple. You are the temple. So there's a warning with this. Whew. If anyone destroys the temple, God will destroy him. Are you get this? My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if anyone destroys God's temple, that's why we believe life is so sacred. Life is so sacred because that's a temple, okay, of God. So I don't want to do anything to destroy this body. Now, with substance abuse... You know, this is why in, in the history of, of, of the evangelical church, there was always the old preachers. People said, well, they always preach negative about all these terrible things. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs. I mean, they're going to go down the list. These men are taking all the fun out of your life. But they're trying to honor. What they're trying to say was, listen, your body's God's temple. When you do something in excess that destroys the temple, it's an affront to the temple of God. So you've got to be careful of what you eat. You've got to be careful of what you drink. You've got to be careful of what drugs you take. You've got to be careful of your life. You've got to do all that you can to protect it. That means I need a proper diet. I know what you're thinking. I need you, Pastor, you need to lay off of some of your Diet Coke. <laughs> That's not on a good diet program, that Diet Coke. I, and you know what? You're right. We should exercise our bodies. Why? It's the temple of God. I'm supposed to take care of this thing. You know, part of my body, though, is my brain. I, I, should, I should feed my brain on good stuff, too. 
I'm not putting a commercial in here for that Prevagen that they did on TV. I'm talking about what you feed it, what you put in it, what you think about, all of that. All right? He says, warning, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. And then he gives us the reason. Here it is. For God's temple is sacred. Your body's sacred. Your body is more sacred than this building. I'm telling you right now. It's more sacred than this building. We call this a sanctuary. No, you're the sanctuary. You're the sanctuary. This is a sanctuary when you get in here. It's a sanctuary. Your body is sacred. The word sacred, it's holy. It's set apart. It's consecrated by the Holy Spirit who's taken up. He's called the anointing of the Holy Spirit in other passages. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You've been anointed. You've been consecrated. You are different. You are special. In a stop, turn a person next to you and say, you're special. Come on, I mean it. Turn, turn to somebody next to you and say, you're special. You're special. Thank you. You see, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are special. That's what the word holy means. That's what the sacred thing means. You've been a set apart from all the rest. I use the illustration of people who have their sacred dishes at home. Called fine china. Fine china. You set them apart from all the other everyday dishes. You only use them as special guests. You're on special occasions. You're very careful with them. You, you do not want to drop them. You don't, you, it's not a paper plate. Even worse, it's not styrofoam. Come on. God is saying, listen, your body is special because God the Holy Spirit dwells in you. What you do with your body, you're doing to God's dwelling place. Doesn't that make sense? The reason is, you are that temple. You are that temple. I want to talk about how the sanctity thing works and destroying it and all. And I want to go to an Old Testament passage. It's found in the book of Daniel, chapter 5. And it's a long, lengthy chapter. And so I just picked out some verses to read so you get the picture of what it means about sacred things. You are the sacred things of God. King Belshazzar, that's King Nebuchadnezzar's son. Nebuchadnezzar's off the scene. His son Belshazzar's on the scene. He's reigning in Babylon. And he's having this great banquet. We've got a big, great banquet coming up next Saturday evening, the Centennial Banquet. He's got a great banquet. And he's got thousands of his nobles, and they're drinking their wine, and they're having a wonderful banquet. And while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem when he conquered and destroyed Jerusalem, 586 B.C. He took all the gold and all the treasure, he took it to Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar didn't do anything with it, put it in storage. This is his, this gold is valuable. It's his wealth. But his, his son Belshazzar says, hey, I know there's goblets of gold in there. Let's bring it. Let's, let's take that which is holy and desecrate it by making it something common and profane. So they brought in the gold goblets. They filled it up with their wine. They're having this big bash, this great party. They're drinking and making profane and common and defiled that which is holy. That which is holy. And as they drank the wine, the text says, all of a sudden, suddenly, the finger of a man's hand appeared and it wrote on the plaster on the wall near the lampstand, the royal palace, and the king watched the hand as, as it wrote. This is where we get the expression, the handwriting is on the wall. You've all heard that. There he is. He the, they're having a party, and he's, I'm sure he's rubbing his eyes. Like, Am I really seeing what I'm seeing? A hand all of a sudden appears and starts writing on the... Uh, uh. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his knees began to knock together. That only happens to me when it's really cold out. I start to shiver. But man, he is so scared. His legs gave way, they buckled under, and then all the king's wise men came in. When I'm jumping down some verses. They came in because he'd ordered them to come in, explain what the re reading uh, 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 and the writing said. And so they all come rushing in, but they could not read the writing. And so the queen says, you know, there's this guy from, uh, that used to serve your father, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and he was the wisest of all the wise men. He, he could do and interpret dreams and all those kinds of things. You need to summon him. So they summoned Daniel. 
Daniel was brought before the king, and Daniel said, skipping down through the passage, saying, Belshazzar, your dad didn't honor the Lord, and he struck him with mental illness. So they acted like an animal. He went out on all fours. He was eating grass like an ox. And he said he, he was struck with insanity for, for a season. And then he was restored. And he said, and he didn't honor God. And he said, now, and you do not honor God. The God who holds in his hand your life in all your ways. You're not honoring God. You know what he's talking about? You took the vessels of the temple and you desecrated them. Folks, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when I desecrate it, it is a very offensive thing to God. He says, therefore, he sent the hand and wrote the inscription. And then Daniel said, this is the inscription that was written. And he read it. Meany, meany, tickle, parson. Some translations have oofarson because they put the little letter vob on there, and that makes it and. So it would be meany, meany, tickle, and parson. Okay. Why couldn't they read it? Well, it could have been because it was written in Hebrew and they didn't know Hebrew. Probably not. It probably could have been written, uh, maybe it was written backwards. Okay. Maybe it was written upside down. Maybe it was written in an angle. So I don't know. They could not read it, but Daniel immediately saw it and read it. And he goes on, he says, and this is what it means. Meaning, God has numbered your days of your reign and brought it to an end. You're finished. What? He abused the vessel, and he says, boom, it's over. You're done. He then added, tekel, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting, lacking. This is a term for judgment. Am I good outweighing my bad? <laughs> good thing I'm saved because my good will never outweigh my bad. You know that. We're saved by grace. But here, this guy, he's saying, listen, in the justice system, okay, we're not talking about grace here, we're talking about justice. In the justice system, the scales have been tipped. You are guilty. What's he guilty of? Desecrating the temple of God. Desecrating the temple of God. Perez, your kingdom will be divided. That's what it means, Perez, the division. Your kingdom is divided, and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. He said, listen, you're finished. I'm sending someone to destroy you. Now, you've got to realize, Babylon was a superpower of the day, kind of like the United States. Babylon, uh, the city of Babylon, had these great walls around it that protected them. Right through the center of Babylon, there was a, a river, and the walls went right down to the river, and so the river came up under the walls and through the city, so they had water supply. And so, while he is having this great banquet, outside is the Median Persian army. They've been there for some time. They've tried to take the city, and they can't. The walls are just impenetrable. And so as a result, they start a campaign of digging canals. I think there was like 130 canals to divert the water. And at that very moment, the Bible tells us that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. What they did is they all of a sudden diverted all the water into those canals. The river dropped, and they were able to march their army under the wall into the city and conquer the city on that very day. Why? Because the temple of God was desecrated. You can think, you know, I'm getting away with this. God doesn't know. Yeah, he knows. Well, nobody knows. Yeah, God knows. Your body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, is sacred to God. That's why we do everything we can. Life is so sacred, we do every, we, everything we can to save the body. Now, I know it's a losing battle. None of us gets out of here alive in life unless the rapture takes place. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. We're fighting this battle, but we are to fight for the glory of God, to honor God in my body, to keep it fit, to keep it healthy, to keep it holy, to keep it pure, 
to use my body for the glory of God. It is his temple. He dwells in me. So this is a warning. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. You are that temple. Now, here's the flip side. This is not the biblical. I'm just saying I believe this is the flip side. I'm going to take out the destroy, destroy, and say, read this way. If anyone builds God's temple, anyone maintains God's temple, God will bless him. I believe that with all my heart. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Instead of destroying your body, you want to do all that you can to build, maintain your body. And God will bless you. God will bless you. And that includes all kinds of, of, of abuses. You know, God has parameters for our sexual orientation, for our sexual habits. He has, he has uh, marriage. He, if you're, if you're going to be a sexual person, you have to be married. It has to be a person of the opposite sex. Somebody else is not married to somebody else, okay? You can't be married. You can't be, that's adultery. You, you can't be doing all those other things, fornicating, all the rest. This is God's building. It's his temple. He dwells in this. And when we go on those other paths, when I don't have self-control over how much I eat and I'm gaining too much weight and everything is too hard for me, this is God's temple. He's wanting me to be active and do things for his glory, and I'm slowing myself down. You know, if I'm not taking the appropriate medication, but I'm abusing other medication, oh my goodness, I'm messing with God's temple. He's saying, no, do what you're supposed to do. You do what the doctor tells you to do for the better health of your body. You do those things. He turns a corner at verse 18 in our passage that we're dealing with here. He says, in the temple's wisdom, he says there's a temple's wisdom, God's wisdom, versus worldly wisdom. He said, do not deceive yourself. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standard of this, world, this age, the world, standard of the world, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. He says, there's, there's people in our world, they think they're really wise. Uh, we have people today uh, who think uh, in science that the Bible is all washed up. I, I, believe, I believe all my heart, I trust the Bible over I do the scientists today. I often ask, people say, well, I believe in science. I say, what science do you believe in? Do you believe in the Middle Age science, that the earth's still flat? Well, they say, no, no, I don't believe in that. I say, okay, do you believe in the science, the medical science of, you know, uh, about 100 years ago when they believed that, uh, you know, you should be bloodletting, cut yourself and just drain out all the bad blood? He said, no, no, I don't believe in that science. I said, what science do you believe in? Do you believe in the science that was pre-Einstein science, or do you believe in relativity? Do you believe in, what science do you believe in? You see, science is constantly changing. And what you believe today, probably disproved. Not too long from now. Why? What, what, what do you believe in science? And people, he said, do not deceive yourselves. I say, oh, no, I don't believe the Bible. I believe in science. No, I believe the Bible. Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Politics. <sighs> Folks, we could have a series of messages on the mess that's in politics, wouldn't we? This whole politically correct junk? Are you kidding me? Politically correct, all this, all this nonsense? I don't know, I, I guess I'm supposed to start referring to you as it. <laughs> all you it's out there. Are you, this is crazy. <sighs> but that's the standard of the world. Don't be deceived by all that nonsense. God made you with a DNA. Ask any biological science what you are. They'll say, oh, let me see your DNA. You're a male. You're a female. You're not an it. That's it. Psychologically. Oh, man, you know, we got all kinds of psychological, theoretical about who you are, what you are. The one that kills me is just people's self-esteem. And we got, a, we got a problem today. Everybody's a winner. There's no losers. How could we? You can't give somebody a trophy, a trophy for winning, because it will tear down the self esteem of the loser. Well, no, they're a loser. Come on, they lost. Get over it. That's part of life. All right? I go to the Bible. The Bible has a psychology. There's a, a year ago I read a, a long theological book on the, the, theolog, the theology of psychology from the Bible. And God's given us a mind, he's given us a heart, he's given us a conscience. And there's all these terms that are all psychological terms in the Bible. The Bible deals with this. You see, the Bible touches everything that there is in life. 
And, and if you want to find it out, you just look in the Word of God, you search and you study the Word of God, and ultimately you'll find the conclusion, even the psychological issues. Philosophy. Oh my goodness. Philosophy. The queen of all philosophies is theology. Everything else comes underneath that. Theology, theology. We're in a new, the new, new age. Oh, we got this problem today. They're trying to mix everything together. The new age has, so there's God, there's one God, and everybody's worshiping, worshiping the same God from different directions. Are you kidding me? There's this guy that was uh, meeting with some Muslims and Buddhists and all, all these different guys, and he said, if I get the picture right, you've been telling me about all this. He said, it's kind of like God is at the top of the mountain. And we're all trying to climb that mountain from different ways, but we're going to the same, same God. And they all said, yes, yes, you're getting it. And the missionary says, I think you got it backward. What if I were to tell you that God came down, became one of us? And he started telling about Jesus. You got it wrong. The Bible says there's only one way, Jesus Christ. It's not all this mixed bag of religion. No, no. Listen, it says, that's the way the world thinks. He says, he thinks that he is wise by the standard of this age. There's a new morality out there. Not too long ago, a young man said to me, oh, you're just old-fashioned. Nobody does that. Everybody moves in and lives together. I don't care. You're destroying the temple of God because it's holy and it's sacred and you're desecrating it. I'm sorry. That's what the Word of God says. And when you build your life on the Word of God, you accept that, you believe that, you honor that. And the Bible's very clear. Hey, listen, if you, if you have sexual impulses for someone and they with you, he says, get married. It's better to marry than to burn. This passage was about burning. The fire is going to be put towards it. The wood, hay, and the stubble has gone. Only the gold, silver, and precious stones remain. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, listen, don't let the world's wise people, the wisdom of this world, be your standard. Don't, don't, don't. He said, instead, if anyone thinks he's wise, he should become a fool. You see, that's what I am. You go to any of the people of the world. You go to the philosophers. You go to the scientists, and they say, you're such a fool. You believe in a book that's over 2,000 years old or even older, and you believe that? You're, you're such a fool. You see what? I'm the fool because I believe in the Word of God. He says, uh, no, no. If he thinks he's wise by the standard, he needs to become a fool like me so that he may become wise like Solomon. Solomon. Solomon was asked by God. He said, listen, I'll give you anything you want, anything you want. Solomon said, hey, I need a little time. He thought about it and said, I need, I need wisdom and discernment to be able to know how to judge your people. Whoa. He didn't ask for fortune. He didn't ask for fame. He didn't ask all, all those things. And God said, I'm going to give you wisdom and I'm going to give you all the rest that you didn't ask for too. Isn't it great? I think that's the way God operates. You see, when you keep yourself holy and pure and you honor the Lord in your body and your mind and your heart, God blesses. When you build up your body, He blesses. That's the Word of God. He blesses. He gives you everything you need, everything, often what you want. He says, so that you may become wise. He says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness. This is, this is the way God sees the, the, the wise man of the world. You know, he sees me that way, but God sees him that way. Who would you rather have looking at you that way? I'd rather have the world looking at me and saying you're a fool than God saying you're a fool any day of the week. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the sight of God, as is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. He knows that they're just trying to pull over the wool over his eyes. He says, I know what he's trying to do to me. He's trying to pass off that fake science as if it's the real thing. Listen, I created it. It did not Big Bang unless you understand the Big Bang was what I did at the very beginning. He catches them in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. You know what the word futile means? Zero. Nothing. They think they are so doggone wise. And he said, you are Nothing. Zero. Zero. Get down to our, our last point, the temple's superiority. It's superior to man's 
So then no more boasting about men. Don't focus on people. You see, if, I didn't start at the beginning of this chapter, but at the beginning of the chapter, in the church, some people are saying, oh, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm Paul. And then the real pious one says, oh, I follow Jesus. Hmm. Paul, Apollos, Peter, they're all following the steps of Jesus. So they're all, and, and what he's saying here is, stop being focused on people. Don't focus on people, what they might think. I'm not focused on the guy who's a smart scientist who says you're dumb, you're, you're, you're a dumb, dumb as a rock because you believe in the Bible. I, I don't focus on him. I focus on the Lord. I don't care what he thinks about me. I care what the Lord thinks about me. No more boasting about men. So then, no more boasting about men. He says, all things are yours. Everything is yours. Listen to this. Whether Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. Listen, it doesn't matter. God gave you all these people. You know, often there's people who say, well, I'm a follower of this preacher. I'm a follower of that preacher. You know, I go to this church or that church. I never run down any of them. We need every church. We need every preacher. We need every person because we're in a bigger battle. We're just a little part of the bigger church of Christ. Every, every part is needed. Every person is needed. Everyone's got the Holy Spirit's temple of God. We need them all. Doesn't matter if it's Paul Paulus, Cephas, doesn't matter who it is, we need all of our preachers. He says, or the world. He says, listen, all things are yours. The world is yours. Don't let the world make you its belonging to it. Don't become of the world. Bring the world under subjection to what you know about Christ. He says, or life. Life is yours. And he goes on and he says, death is yours. I had a strange call this morning, a person with an anonymous request asking me to pray for someone who was dying. I asked for their name, they didn't give it to me. But I said, I'll pray, and I prayed with them over the phone. Scared to death of death. And I tried to explain, when you know Jesus, when you know Jesus, to be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. <laughs> Come on. Which Paul says is far better but I'm supposed to take care of my body so I don't die. He's going to take me home when it's my appointed time. You know, of all the appointments I have, I've skipped a few doctor appointments, dentist appointments, but I'm not going to miss that appointment. It's appointed when a man wants to die. I'm going to, I said, you know what? None of us gets out of here alive unless the rapture occurs. Listen, he says, all things are yours. It's all yours. It's all yours. Even the present, the present is yours and the future is yours. What is he trying to say? They all belong to you, so take ownership. Ownership. Don't let the future intimidate you. You own it. You take it in a positive way. I go to Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. I don't have the future giving anything that make me fearful because I know God has a bigger plan that trumps it. He's going to work everything together for good. I don't allow anything of this world to control me. I am the one with, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's in me, who's going to dominate this because the Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Isn't that amazing? I have a future. He says, all, all are yours. Don't let it intimidate you. Don't let it control you. And you, he says, belong to Christ. You belong to Jesus. Because you belong to Jesus, everything's good. And then he adds this, and Jesus belongs to God. God. You know, if you ever get a little discouraged, I encourage you, read the book of Revelation. When you get down to the end, guess what? We're on the winning side. We win. We win. We win. So what do we learn today? We learn a few things. First of all, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. Your body is to be treated like a te temple, something very sacred. Because God resides in you. And because of that, we must honor him in our bodies. And if I do, he will bless me. He will bless me. He will bless me. I have to think God's thoughts after him, not the world's thoughts. If I want to become wise, I don't want to become wise in the world's standard. I want to become wise before God, that I'm going to have to think God's thoughts after him, which means you have to get into the Bible and allow the Bible to get into you. Those are his thoughts. Those are his thoughts. And the bottom line is, you've got to own it all. Don't let it own you. You've got to take ownership of it. You've got to take control. Own it. 
don't let it own you. Don't let it own you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, these are great truths. May they be embedded in our minds and in our spirit and in our heart. So when we go from this place, we realize I am someone very special. That Jesus Christ died for me. The Holy Spirit resides within me. And the Father calls me his own. Because I'm special, I'm going to treat my body as a temple of God, a holy thing, and not profane it, not misuse it, nor abuse it. I'm not even going to allow my mind to dwell on things that are hurtful. Oh Lord, I'm not going to consume that which would destroy me. I'm going to make sure that I have a sacred temple that you can dwell in it with pleasure and feel at home. And Father, I'm not going to allow this world to push me into its mold. I'm going to own the world and not let it own me. I'm surrendering to you. My life I give. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, that song, Lord, keep making me. You know, I'm not, the Lord's not finished with me yet. <laughs> I know he's not finished with you yet either. <laughs> you know, those, that, he wants us to honor him in our temple, our bodies. And every one of us makes that choice every day, what I'm going to do. Will I honor the Lord or am I going to do it my way? I promise you, if you do it his way, you will be blessed. You will be blessed.